good evening. And Pastor Philip and I do tease each other a little bit about him sort of sneak preaching and things like this, but I always can count on I don't have to build too much of an introduction as long as he's going to get up before me. So, um, as thank you. <laughs> as, uh, as Pastor Philip just mentioned, one of the things that is really going to guide, especially this evening, and, and so much of how I, I want to approach this series as we discuss heaven is, the more we know, the more we'll desire. And, and that really is the central idea of where we're going to be heading this evening. And uh, as, as I was preparing for this, one of the things I mentioned to Pastor Philip is, is the problem with considering the subject of heaven and, and the eternal state of believers is it's just so big. There's a little bit of a limitation in that there is a, a, a limited amount of scripture that deals with descriptors of heaven, that, that deal with, hey, this is what it's going to be like. And especially when you get into some of the most common questions that, that people will come up with, the sort of, am I going to have wings? Am I, am I going to know everything? going to get my own, what is this going to look like? Uh, heaven is actually, or the, the scripture is actually relatively quiet concerning a lot of those descriptors. But when we actually take a step back and consider what is being communicated about heaven, it, it is such a vast and expansive subject that, that it's a real challenge to sort of say, all right, from, from which angle are we going to approach this? How, how are we going to tackle this subject? Recently, we did the, the series, the Death and Dying series, and we discussed the glory of heaven. And in that, we looked at three points, and we considered why heaven is to be desired, some descriptions of heaven that are given, and who heaven is for. And as I was beginning this evening, one continual question kept uh, uh, coming into mind as I, was, as I was beginning to put the structure on what we're going to be looking at for tonight. And really, it is connected to that idea of why heaven is to be desired. Because when we really start thinking about, all right, why do I want to go to heaven? Why do I want to go to heaven? The answer to that question will, will tell us an awful lot about the condition of our own heart. It'll tell us an awful lot about our, our, our own conviction about who God is and what the purpose of heaven is. And I want to start out by saying this, that our appetite for heaven will correspond to your appetite for the Lord. I want to say that again because it is massive as we consider this. Our appetite for heaven will correspond to our appetite for the Lord. When we really consider that the glory and the prize of heaven is we will be with Christ, if we're not all that interested in him, we're not going to be very interested in heaven. Because heaven is all about him. Writing about this one pastor named Jeff Thomas wrote, heaven means Jesus Christ. That is being with Jesus. That is the only heaven there is. That's the testimony of scripture as well. Jesus in the high priestly prayer in John 17 says, in this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the essence of heaven, the perfect and absolutely unmitigated fellowship and union with the Father in Christ Jesus. That's what heaven is characterized as. One writer said, so often in the New Testament, the language that's used is they went to be with the Lord. That's the language of Scripture is that those who depart, they, they don't go to heaven. They go to be with the Lord. And, and that's the glory and the prize why heaven is to be desired. It, it's not the, the cartoony harps and halos and cloud cover. That picture of heaven really has no real basis in Scripture. The sort of Tom and Jerry, they're floating around in a robe and halo and harp. That's, that's a caricature of heaven. That, that's like saying that the doodle of a toddler with their new box of Crayolas is like the starry night by Van Gogh. There's really no comparison to be made. So we have to ask ourselves if the reality of heaven is its union with Christ. That's the glory, that's the prize of heaven. Do we really want to go? Do we really want to go to heaven? If that's what there is to look forward to, are our hearts excited by that singularly? And I would even say chiefly, 
Are our hearts excited by that, or are we just sort of, you know, I'm just really looking for it. And we, we use this language, and it is a promise that's given. We'll, we'll consider some of this later. But is it just, hey, I'm not going to have this broken down body anymore. That is a blessing. But understand, the blessing that we look forward to most is that the body that we will have will have been fitted for enjoying God and all of his unveiled glory. That's what we're looking forward to. And if that's the reality of heaven, how much have we thought about it recently? When we consider heaven, is our chief thought about heaven, I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm going to see him face to face. Yes, there's the reunion with the saints, but I'm going to be with the Savior. Is that what occupies our thoughts? When we say, yeah, I've, I've thought about heaven, have we thought biblically about heaven? Have we given it really any thought? Because as we're going to see even further into this series, our consideration of heaven has a massive, massive impact on our walk with the Lord, on our sanctification. But we, we're going to see even this evening, it's part of the prize that we're reaching forward to. It's part of the thing that propels us deeper into sanctification and Christ likeness to say, I, I want to be like him and I'm going to be like him. And so in the present, while I'm here, I'm leaning into eternity, into Christ likeness, because I, I know that's the end. That's the thing to which I'm striving. Or how about this? This is something else that Pastor Philip mentioned. It, it's a place of reward. It's a place of reward for those who are in Christ. It, it's a place that we are told to store up treasure in heaven. If we give heaven no thought, are we sure that we're actually having that mindset? Are we laboring for the reward that, that doesn't perish? It's imperishable. It's undefiled. Heaven is the destination of believers. It's the destination of those who are longing to see him. And as we see him, we are made more like him. And as I mentioned, if, if we don't really have any capacity of, you know, we don't have any capacity of desire for him, Christ-likeness, you know, I just really, I guess it would be good. Then that reveals that we really don't have a capacity of, no, 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 do, do we know just how good he is? Do we really grapple with the goodness of our God? One of the things that, as I've studied and been preparing over the last several days for this, one of the things that I've really wrestled with is if we start out by saying, let's talk about the glory of God and, and how in heaven we're going to be with him. One of the things that we're limited by is if I say, hey, we're going to be with God and, and our view of God is small, then our desire for heaven is equally small. So we have to begin with this question of, do we, do we really want to go? If that's where we're headed, if heaven is our destination, if union with God, fellowship with him is where we are desiring earnestly to be, it makes sense that we would think about it often and well. Uh, around here at the school, one of the things that we'll talk about at different points in the year is uh, how far we are until different breaks. One of the, the, the habits that I've had, I didn't start it this year, I don't know if I will, is that very often I'll, I'll do a countdown on the corner of my board, the corner of my whiteboard in, in my classroom. And I usually start it within the first week of school. And, and I'll put up there, today it would be 288 days. And my students inevitably will come in, Mr. Maggard, what's that? Well, that's the countdown to summer. And usually, oh, Mr. Maggard. <laughs> Why can't you do a countdown to Christmas? It's closer. Why can't you do a countdown to, and when we get to the, past the 100 day mark, when it's 99 days until summer break, I'll start another countdown. It's the countdown until how many days until we return in the next school year. Why? Well, because we're looking forward to something. Well, I don't want to think about that, Mr. Maggard. Why? Because I'm not really looking forward to it. Let's take that to our consideration of heaven. Do we think about it? 
Are we really looking forward to it? One of the things that will happen also is whenever we plan a trip, like spring break, our family will go on a trip on spring break, and one of the things that we'll talk about sort of around with other teachers, can't think too much about it. Why? Because if I start thinking about that, my focus is all going to be there, and I'm not going to be any good right here. And sometimes we have this sort of corrupted idea of you're going to be with, in regard to heaven, you're going to be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. There's no such thing. If we're viewing heaven as it's portrayed in scripture, that's not really a problem of, you know, I'm just thinking so much about my destination that I'm not getting anything done around here. No, no, no. The way that scripture portrays it is when we have our affection fixed on our heavenly home, we are of most effectiveness here. We tend to think, sometimes wrongly, that thoughts about heaven, that, that's for others. That's for those who are facing death imminently. Maybe, maybe they've gotten a bad diagnosis. Maybe they've had a loss in their family. Maybe, maybe they're just getting into a season of life where it seems like there's more years behind them than there are ahead of them. They should be thinking about heaven. After all, we've got lots of time, right? But beloved, let's be clear. That doesn't really matter. Even if we don't arrive on the shore of that heavenly realm for another hundred years, we would do well to consider our desire for heaven. We would do well to think about, this will be my home forever. I, I should be thinking about that. This, everything that I'm seeing, experiencing, doing, and investing in here, even if the Lord gives me another hundred years here, I've got how many more, hundreds of thousands of millions of years there. And where's my affection ultimately located? In the first place in Scripture, I want to draw your attention this evening as we consider this is a very familiar place. It's Philippians chapter 1. Paul's declaration about his own estimation, his evaluation of heaven. We're going to look beginning in verse 21. Of Philippians chapter 1. And here Paul is, he's relaying sort of his own condition to the church at Philippi. And he's discussing with them, hey, I, I've been placed in this imprisonment. I've been placed in this, this situation of hardship. But the Lord has used it for the furtherance of the gospel. And, and I'm trusting that it's going to turn out for my release. But either way, here's my heart set on this. Verse 21. For to me... To live is Christ. To die is gain. But if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But let's just pause there for a second. Do we live this way? Do, do we live in such a way to say, if I live, it's going to be fruitful labor for the benefit of the body of Christ. But if I depart, as he's about to say, that's a hard choice. That's a hard choice. Should, should, I, should I stay and be fruitful here among you, or should I go on? Verse 23, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. I, I don't really believe that Paul was one to trifle with words. I don't think one that, that Paul was one to, to really work in hyperbole and say, you know, I'd really like to go to heaven, but, or to say, that'd be really good. The, the language that he's using here is, is drawing great emphasis to this. He says, I have this desire to depart. But let's put our own heart under the microscope and, and just evaluate our estimation of things in line with the example of the apostle here. Do we have a desire to depart? Are we clinging so hard and fast to this world to say, mm, I don't really want to go. If given the opportunity, Lord, take me now or just two more weeks. Are we saying, no, 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 I have a desire to depart. I have an eagerness, I have a passionate longing to be absent from this body. 
and to be present with the Lord. Do we have a desire specifically to be with Christ? That's how he words it, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. It's not just, hey, I don't, want to, I don't want to be in prison anymore. There's a part of this that we could look at and say, that's kind of reasonable. Paul's in difficult circumstances. You read through the, the chronicle of his hardships in his letter to the church at Corinth, and, and you can say, I get it. Paul's ready to go. He's been beaten, shipwrecked, stoned nearly to death. He's been in prison frequently. He's in danger all the time. His life is regularly hazarded for the sake of the gospel. Everywhere he goes, he's got enemies. He has opponents that are, that, are, that are seeking to slander him. He's got people that want to put him in prison. He's got people that want to put him to death. I can see Paul saying, look, I just want to be out of this. But the emphasis really lays with, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. I want to see him. I long to be in his presence. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Do we estimate it to be very much better? That, that's how he concludes verse 23. For that is very much better. It is so much better to be with Christ. Even then, even then, fruitful labor among you, oh yeah, it's very much better. The language that Paul used here is the same, the, the word for better that he uses is the same word that the author of Hebrews uses about 12 times to describe the qualitative superiority of Christ and his work. It's a better covenant, a better sacrifice. He's better than angels, same word. It's, it's a greater thing, superior in contrast of excellence. And he stacks this description when he says, it's very much better. It's where we get the word poly, meaning many, or greater. He's saying it is very much, it is far greater by, by, by uh, layers of degrees, far better to depart and be with Christ. Does our desire look like this? Or do we have sort of a, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm really looking forward to going to heaven one day. I, I think maybe one of, the main one of the main things we struggle with is that we haven't been convinced from the scriptures that it really is better. I think that whenever we're struggling with what heaven is and whether or not we want to go now, it's, it's because we've got a twisted, disproportionate estimate of heaven versus earth. We're somehow viewing heaven as slightly superior, not very much better. We're viewing heaven as, well, there's a lot that I enjoy here. Whenever we're struggling with this view, it's because we've got a disproportionate view of heaven and earth. Yeah, I long to be with Christ, but you know, I, I've got my family. We're going to talk about this later, but idols come in all sorts of varieties. And if we would look and say, no, 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 I don't want to go now because we may have just named our idol. We may have just named, no, no, no this thing takes precedent before Christ. Because to depart is to be with him if we're a believer. And so if we're saying, no, 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 I like this more, enjoy this more, treasure this more than Christ, we've just named where our affection truly lies. We certainly see heaven is better than hell. I think that's often where if we ask the question, do you want to go to heaven? Well, I certainly don't want to go to hell. So, Sure. Harps, halo is not really my thing, but I don't want to go to hell. We're not really sure whether or not we'll enjoy it. We're not really sure whether or not it's going to be all that it's cracked up to be. I mean, won't we get bored? 
And that stems from a broken view of the centerpiece of heaven. It stems from a broken view of, no, no, no. We're going to see the Lord of heaven and earth without any barrier, without any limitation, will have been fitted out for such a purpose as that. I think we tend not to think about it or meditate on it because we're not convinced of its greatness. But the great attraction of heaven is Christ. And I think when we straighten that mindset out for believers, heaven begins to regain its luster. Maybe we haven't really thought about heaven. Maybe it's sort of sat on a dusty shelf in our mind of, yeah, heaven. It's, it, we're, we're heading that way. And for believers, we sort of can tend to treat it like an inevitability of, well, I've trusted in Christ. I'm laboring in the Lord right now. And that's sort of taking up all the focus. But I know eventually when I die or the Lord returns, I'll, I'll wind up there. And sort of relegate it to the sidelines of our affection. But then when we talk about, are you eager to see the Lord? Oh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I want that. Th that resonates with a believer. This is a marvelous check on, am I, am I in Christ? Do I have any affection for him? Do I have any desire to see him and be with him where he is? Or am I just sort of stuck here on this level of the here, the now, the moment, the, the grit and gritty of this life. Have I forgotten? That's where I'm going. We start to desire heaven. We remember that, that heaven is the reunion, not just with the dearly departed, but with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn just a few pages over with me to Philippians chapter 3. This is probably, these two verses are probably some of my favorite verses. Some of my favorite verses on looking forward to the, the, the reunion with Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. There's so much taking place in these verses here, and we don't have time, we're not going to unpack all of this this evening. But one of the things that he's saying here is, one of the things that we are eagerly awaiting is the Lord who will transform us to be like him. He will transform us to be like him. That's what we're eagerly waiting and longing for is that transformation. The transformation that will enable us to enjoy him. The transformation that will enable us to abide in his presence and not be consumed. The context, by the way, for this is exactly what we're talking about. Just a few verses back, he's, he's talking about those who are enemies of the cross. And one of the characteristics of them is in verse 19, their minds are set on earthly things. Which means by implication, those who are not enemies of the cross have set their minds on things above. Where God is. That's what Colossians 3 tells us. That if we have Christ, we are to set our affections on things above. We're to set our minds on the things above where Christ is. That means that consistent with our profession ought to be a sanctified obsession with our heavenly home and our heavenly Lord. If we would say, no, 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 I am a believer. I am in Christ. I've trusted in him. There ought to be that eager longing to be reunited with him. We'll consider that more as we go through the series. But one of the repeated characteristics of heaven is that it's the throne of God. For the child of God, we're eager to be around that throne. We're eager to worship the King of all, the Lord of heaven and earth. We're eager as a characteristic of being his subject to no longer being, in one sense, behind enemy lines. But we're eager to be back. This language that he uses here in verse 20, our citizenship is from heaven. 
that's a consistent theme that's used for believers in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, Paul's going to write, and he's going to say, we've been transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Don't you wait? Can't you wait to be back into the home kingdom? Can't you wait to be back in the presence of the king to whom you're loyal? For our time tonight, I want us to consider that question I posed earlier. Do, do we want to go to heaven? And if we answer yes, we'd better understand what it takes to bring us to heaven. Because if we think that, as one author wrote, that we're all just kind of on a conveyor belt to heaven. We've got another thing coming. If we think that, you know, all I've got to do is, is die and I'll get there, then we are sorely, sorely mistaken. Not everybody makes it. And that's a serious consideration. Not everybody will be in heaven. John Nelson talks about this often. He talks about the midnight chaplain visits he goes on. All those people, they're in heaven, according to their loved ones. It seems like there's not really any rhyme or reason. that They may have been the most obscene, profligate, God-hating individual. But let death come knocking on the door, and you know, that person's ready for their angel wing fitting. I know they're in heaven. I know they're with Jesus. I know they're with the angels now. And that's just not the reality. And beloved, our gospel urgency will live on that reality. That reality of, no, 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 we can't just take it for granted everybody makes it. Death is not the automatic door into eternity in heaven. It is an automatic door into eternity, but it may not be to heaven. So if we answer, yes, I, I want to go to heaven, I want us to consider these three realities this evening. What does it take? Number one, and none of these are going to be a surprise to the, this group this evening, but, but I want this to be a strengthening, challenging consideration for our heart tonight. Number one, we must be born again. Number two, we must strive. We must strive. And three, we must be changed. We must be born again. We must strive. And we must be changed. First of all, we must be born again. I'm taking this directly from Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus in John 3. In John chapter 3, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he's asking the question, the, the, the critical question is he <clears throat> comes and actually introduces the whole thing of, <clears throat> teacher, we know there's something different about you. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night, said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, a couple things we need to understand. <clears throat> when we talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it's helpful to understand sort of two parts to this. There's what's sometimes been called the universal kingdom. This is God's sway over everything. We talk about there's not one rogue molecule in all of the universe. That God has his will and has his perfect way over everything. Another sort of aspect of understanding the kingdom of God, though, is what's sometimes called the mediatorial or the mediated kingdom. And this is God's, the realm in which God's rule is challenged by sin this earth. God still rules and reigns over everything, and yet it's challenged. And one of the things that we, one of the places where we see this really clearly just testified to is in the Lord's Prayer. Think, think about the petition. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a confession of these two kingdoms. There is a sense in which the will of God is always being done, and then there's a desire that at some point, and it will come to pass, where his will, be, his will will be done unchallenged. His will will be done when 
all of his enemies have been put underfoot and put away for eternity. And we're longing for the culmination of those two kingdoms when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And what Jesus is telling Nicodemus in John chapter 3 is that he has no hope of becoming a partaker of the kingdom of heaven, of experiencing that unchallenged kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus, you can't be a part of that. You cannot have any part of being one of the subjects, one of the servants who says you are a servant to the Lord God without being born again. In other words, we cannot go to heaven without being born again. We have to be born not just of the flesh, but of the spirit. That's one of the things he's going to say in just a few verses here. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But we have to have life in his name. We have to have life through Christ alone. In order to enter into heaven, we have to have been united by grace through faith to Christ. We have to have been born of God. We have to have been brought to life by the Spirit of God. Without this, we will not see the kingdom of heaven. We will not experience peace with God, fellowship and union with him in this life or in eternity. One of the things that we have to consider when we consider this is the cost. What did, it, <clears throat> what did it cost for us to be born again? What did it cost for us to enter into heaven, to have that peace with God? We all know the scriptures that deal with this. We all know the, the, the familiar text. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was crushed for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. His suffering purchased our pardon. This matters because that means that our enjoyment of God was purchased, as Acts 20, 28 tells us, with the blood of his own son. That means that the only way by which we enter into heaven is through the suffering, our faith in the suffering of Christ. It's one of the things that makes the words of Christ and the high priestly prayer so incredible. In John 17, verse 24 the Lord says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, who loved me before the foundation of the world. What was it about to cost Christ to have that prayer? They may be with me where I am. It was going to cost him. It did cost him. Experiencing the wrath of God that's due us so that we could be with him. Christ is so set upon his glory being enjoyed by his people that he suffers the wrath of the Father to bring them to himself. That, that's what it cost for us to enter into heaven. When we consider that, when we consider that the Father crushed the Son to bring us to glory, don't you think it's worth meditating upon? Don't you think it's worth having that estimation? This is the prize that we would be with him. And it cost the crushing of the Son of God for us to have it. Ought we not to think about it? Ought we not to consider it, to set our affection on it? And say, Father, if it's so precious, let me see. Let me savor. Let me look forward to longing for, looking toward and saying, I, I want that. I want to draw near to that. Don't you think it's, in, it's worth investing our desire and setting our affections upon? Because, by the way, those are the commands of Scripture. If we have been born again, if we have peace with God, I, I mentioned it already, but it bears quote in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, 
seated at the right hand of God. If we have indeed been born again, which is the only way by which we can enter into the kingdom of heaven, if we have been born again, we're to keep seeking the things above. Seek them. That takes us to our next point. We must strive. Being born again means that we will enter into heaven. We will enter into the inheritance. But that does not mean that now, all right, I've trusted in Christ. I'm going to sit back and enjoy the ride until glory. You look at the language of the New Testament. There's not really a category for that. You look at the commands, like the one we just read in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. There's not really this, hey, once you trust in Christ, sit back, coast, enjoy the world while you have it, because eventually you won't. There's not a category for that in the New Testament. Rather, there's a, now run towards the goal that has been purchased for you. Instead, there's this idea of, now, because you're in this fight, fight. Put up your hands, start swinging, and move. There's this idea of you're in the race, don't stand there. Hebrews 3.11 warns us after offering the example of Old Testament Israel in the wilderness, therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through, this, through following the same example of disobedience. In other words, we are warned continuously throughout the New Testament. You might be starting well, but if there's not a continuance, if there's not that perseverance, it's a demonstration that that start wasn't true, wasn't legitimate. That you were a sucker branch on the vine. There's no life in you. The proof of the life of Christ in us is the daily striving after holiness. That daily striving after, no, 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 I want to seek to enter in through the narrow gate. I am chasing that down. I am striving, fighting, running, putting off, and putting on. Laboring to enter into the rest. And that sounds a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? That sounds a little bit of, I've got I've to like fight to rest. But that's exactly the language of Scripture. No, no, we fight now to rest then. We strive now to rest then. One author put it this way, one glimpse. One glimpse, one moment into heaven. And we'll look back on everything, all of the toil, all of the sweat, all of the labor, all of the putting to death, the deeds of the flesh, and we'll go, what in the world? To paraphrase this author, because he wrote about 500 years ago, I'm not going to try to quote it. He, he's going to say, that's what tried to fool me? I almost got choked out from this by all of the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, all of those shiny things that look so good then, what was I thinking? Our striving on the one hand is trusting. We're fighting for our faith. We're fighting to continue trusting and resting in the Lord and Him alone. We're fighting our own idolatry. We're fighting to uproot it. We're fighting to find, what else am I trusting in? We're fighting to find what else has, has got a hold of me, has got its hooks in me, and, and is trying to choke me out from enjoying the richness of heaven. And we're laboring to shrug those things off. We're running with all of our might. Now, please understand one of the things about this that sometimes either our flesh or the devil can delude us into thinking is that somehow the fact that we're fighting is bad. The fact that we're fighting is good news. But we get in this mindset sometimes that thinks, man, I'm really fighting right now. I'm really fighting right now. Something must be wrong. Your soul's at stake. Fight with everything you've got. 
Fight because there is a heaven to win. My goodness, do we know what awaits us? What would we not throw into this fight? We're not unique in this. Believers fight. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9. I want us to put our eyes on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, lest we think that somehow, man, I really have to fight sin. That must be strange. I bet those who are more godly than me, they don't have to fight. That's entirely upside down. That's entirely backwards. One of the quotes that we share from, from one, of the, one of the men from long ago is that the older, uh, I believe it was John Knox, the older I get, the more sinfulness I see in myself. The more godly I grow, the more wickedness I see. And that's been the experience of so many saints through the ages that we would look at and we would say, man, these guys ran well. And they would say as they got to the end of their life, I'm more wretched than I ever knew. Here's the testimony of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Is this how we're running the race of faith? Are we running to win, or are we treating it like a fun run? I, I didn't really train for this. I'll, I'll cross the finish line and get the little t-shirt anyway. Or are you like those people who schedule these things? You're training for it. You've got the special shoes and the special gear. You're out there. You want to check your time. Are you running to win? Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Listen to this. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Those are the stakes that Paul just laid out. Paul is saying, I'm fighting this way. I'm running this way. I am disciplining myself in this way. I am pursuing Christ's likeness this way because I don't want to be disqualified. I, I see... I see the stakes. I see what's on the line here. This is an unusual language of the New Testament either, as I already mentioned. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Again, Paul testifying, not that I have already obtained, nor have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. The glorious reality is that when we have been laid hold of by Christ Jesus, our eternity is sure. The evidence, the proof of it, the assurance of it comes through our staying in the fight. We're not running to achieve our salvation. We're running as a demonstration that we have been saved. And if there's no demonstration, what basis do we have? Verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. Look with me just a few pages from here. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, verse 22, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. If we move away from this, if we decide I'm tired of running, I'm off the track, I've decided to give up, I'm not going to fight my sin anymore, 
I'm going to lay down. I'm not going to strive. All that we're doing is proving that it was all a charade. It was all a fraud. We never had been laid hold of. We had never been reconciled. Those who are made alive by the Son of God don't taste death again. This is the language of someone who is, according to the command of Jesus in Luke 13, striving to enter through the narrow gate. This is literally the fight of your life. But we take heart because it's a sure race for those who are in Christ. Again, this doesn't negate our running it. But the idea is that we're looking to the champion of the race. We don't slow down. We don't slack in the place. We press on. Like Paul said, we're looking to the one in whose strength we are running. That pastor I quoted earlier, Jeff Thomas, he says, there's no possibility of heaven without Christ getting us there. At the end of the day, we're born again and we strive because Christ is working within us. Jump down to verse 29 of Colossians chapter 1. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Believer, if you're weary in the race, if you are tired in the striving, if your arms are getting heavy in the fight, know that you are fighting, you are running, you are striving in the strength of the Lord. You understand we are being fitted for glory. That that's what's going on. In the process of sanctification between here and heaven where we receive glorification, we are being fitted out for glory. Authors through the years have said our earthly travails are fitting us for heaven. One pastor I heard recently said, eternity is the place where we finally become what we have been becoming. That's the idea that John the Apostle is communicating in 1 John 3. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who knows this purifies himself even as he is pure. We look and we say, I'm going to be like him. Let me get ready now. I see him. I want to be like him now. Can we begin now? I know it's going to be finished then. I know there's going to be a lot of false starts. I know there's going to be a lot of struggles and trials, and it's going to be painful. But can I start now? Which brings us to the final idea for this evening. We must be changed. We've got to be changed. One way or another, in order, in it, in order to enter into heaven, we've got to be changed. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Beloved, we've got to be changed. What we've got now is not sufficient for what awaits us. Think about that for just a second. For all of the wonder of creation that we're able to enjoy presently in this frail, feeble frame of dust, it's not adequate for what shall be revealed. Our flesh can't handle it. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed for this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality 
then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You understand we're only getting into heaven by death or rapture. Either's fine. Either is fine. And consider, and I would encourage you, I would exhort you, consider it often. What will that moment be? What will death be but a glorious transformation for the believer? One pastor writing many years ago said, I think sometimes even godly men, because they haven't thought of this, they waver at the moment of death. Beloved, what a great testimony. In the final moments that we will have to be able to say, I'm looking forward. I'm going to be changed. There's really... No earthly parallel. This glorious transformation to take, there's not really a thing that we can say, well, it's, it's like this. People have tried to draw par- parallels. People have said, you know, compared to the caterpillar enter- entering into the chrysalis and emerging a butterfly. If you've ever seen like the time-lapse videos of those things, you see this ugly, pudgy, squishy thing go in. Sometimes they have pretty colors, but, but really. They go in, they wrap up. And until recently, when they've had greater technology to be able to look inside that, there was a great mystery of like, what's going on in there? Because the next thing you know, something utterly unlike what went in comes out. But even that pales in comparison. One author was really stretching. They they compared it to an earwig becoming an astrophysicist. All that we can say is it's degrees of glory greater. It's so much, like we mentioned on Sunday, it's greater than our minds can conceive. Because how can finite creatures wrap our mind around the infinite God and enjoying him forever? We'll have to be changed because we'll need it for what we'll be beholding. Turn with me just a few pages from here, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul tells us in verse 18 that we're being transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this this wonderful text of longing, the Apostle puts it this way, beginning in verse 1. We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Do you you notice the language there? It's it's intentional. If this earthly tent, this temporary dwelling that is in every way subordinate to a building, a house, if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And as much as we have, excuse excuse me, and as much as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Do you hear that language? What's mortal will be swallowed up by life. In other words, we're scarcely living now. I think that's something we take for granted. Because this is so much of the only life that we consider, we think, well, heaven must be somehow less than this. And we say it, we hear it in funerals and memorial services. They're more alive now than they've ever been. But it's true. For those that are in Christ, the mortal has been swallowed up by true life. This mortal will be made utterly alive and truly alive. Alive in more ways than our poor sin-besotted brains can possibly describe. 
And that's the final hurdle to be cleared. We have to be changed. So how do we view death? Because to enjoy heaven, to go to heaven, we must be changed. Do we look forward to it? Do we look forward to what Paul said, all the way back where we began in Philippians 3.21, to the transformation that will take place? Are we looking forward and saying, I don't know when, and I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be in death or in his return, but I'm looking forward to it. That's not some creepy morbidity. That's something that only those who have been born of God can say. That's something that only those who have life now and are looking forward to greater life to come can say. I know. We can say with Job, I know my heart, my flesh may fail, but after... I shall live, I shall stand, I, I shall see my Redeemer. There's this confidence that it's not just this life. This life is nothing. It pales in comparison. This life, what do I have to hold on to in this life? Every bit of it is passing away. As we'll see later in this series, one of the things that characterizes heaven is that everything there is not fading. While everything here is. It's corruptible. That's the language of 1 Corinthians 15. It, it can rust. It can decay. It can pass away. And indeed, we're told it will one day pass away. Seeing that all these things will be consumed, what manner of lives ought we to live in all holiness and godliness? Do we press on? Or do we dread it? Do we push it off and say, I just, I just don't want it to be now? What are we saying? I just don't want to see my Lord. I just don't want to be in his presence, worshiping like him, transformed, never ending, never fading, always growing brighter and more wondrous. Do we want to go to heaven? If our minds are saturated with the truth of God's word, I can't, I believe we can't help but say with Paul, it's far better. It's far better. And we can't help but pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are so good that you have revealed these things to us. That you have made known your mind. What you have set your heart upon from eternity past, from before the foundation of the world. This was your design. That those whom you have called and you have saved and that you are sanctifying, will be glorified in your presence to enjoy you forever. What a glorious mystery that you would set your love upon us. That you would send your son, that we would be with him to see his glory. Father God, may our hearts be uplifted. to look through this darkened glass into the glory that awaits. That we would look into your word and that we would meditate, that we would think, that we would consider regularly what glory awaits for those who are yours. And Father, this would move us to declare your goodness to all those that we know, to those that are far off, to those that are in utter darkness, that are spiritually dead while they walk, that they would know the life that only you give. Father, strengthen us for this task, for the sake of your Son's name. Amen.